Um, so hello everyone. Um, today we are very lucky to have uh, Nadav Cohen. So uh, he's an assistant professor of computer science at Tel Aviv uh, University. His research mostly focuses on theoretical and algorithmic foundations of deep learning, uh, like expressiveness, optimization, generalization. And his goal is to derive theoretically sound founded procedures and algorithms that will really improve the practical performance. Um, he obtained his PhD from Hebrew University, and then he spent some time at Institute for Advanced Study, which is actually my background here, um, with working with Sanjeev Arora and Ilad Hazen. Uh, he already obtained several awards for his start work on deep learning, like Google Doctoral Fellowship, uh, Rothschild Postdoc Fellowship, and Document Postdoc Fellowship. So uh, without further ado, uh, let's welcome Nadav uh, to talk about his work, All right? Okay. Thanks a lot, uh, Simon and uh, organizers for uh, inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, and uh, I guess we'll just uh, start. If there are any questions come up, so I don't, I'm not sure, Simon, how it's done with the chat. Uh, either, I think for now we have 50 people. We can either unmute or uh, okay. put your question in the chat, uh, chat box. Yeah. Okay, so unmuting is fine. And if I see that we'll short, we're short in time, then maybe I'll ask to kind of write it down on the chat and then at the end we can. Hmm. Okay, all right, so uh, let's get started. So what I will talk about um, today is analysis of optimization and generalization in deep learning uh, through the dynamics of gradient descent. Okay, so, um, I will start by setting the stage and um, laying out the claim, the argument that I will try to make today. Okay, and then the rest of the talk will be around trying to justify that argument. Okay, so when we talk about uh, optimization and machine learning, at least mostly, most of the time in the context of this talk, uh, what we mean is to fit training data by minimizing some objective, some loss function. Generalization refers to controlling the gap between the train and test errors. Uh, for example, by adding some regularization term or constraint to the objective that we are optimizing. Okay? And optimization and generalization uh, behave very differently in classical machine learning, what we were used to seeing in the past, um, from the way in which they behave in deep learning. So let's take a minute to reflect on that. So in classical machine learning, obviously it's not an entirely well-defined term, but you can think of uh, linear models, SVM, all these kind of um, machinery. And basically the, the theme that we set out from is to choose models and loss functions in a way that will ensure that the objective is convex. And typically that means that there's just one global minimum and it's sufficiently attainable. And the algorithm, the choice of algorithm that you make, it will affect the speed at which you reach this global minimum, but it will not affect generalization because it's the same solution that you're gonna end up in. It might take you more iterations or less, but the generalization is a property of that solution, not the algorithm. Okay? In terms of generalization, we have the uh, well-known bias variance trade-off which qualitatively means that if I add on more regularization, then the gap between train and test errors uh, goes down. Okay, the gap uh, diminishes, but the training error goes up and vice versa. If I lessen the regularization, the gap opens up, um, which is a bad thing, but the train error goes down, which is a good thing. So there's a trade off here. And all in all, I think it's safe to say that um, we had a fairly, uh, or we had a feeling that we have a fairly decent understanding of what's going on here. And in deep learning, the situation is very uh, different. We allow the objective to be non-convex. Okay, we give up on that um, requirement, that limitation. And now things are much more complicated. So in terms of optimization, there's now not just one global minimum, but there are a lot of global minima. And a priori, it's not clear that any of them is efficiently attainable. This is a non-convex problem. Uh, but for some reason, 
on the type of problems that deep learning is typically used for, variants of gradient descent are somehow able to reach one of these global minima. And we don't really understand why. And with generalization, the situation is even more uh, peculiar. Um, we pretty much know for a fact that some global minima generalize well, uh, while others don't. And for some reason on typical data, or typical problems, whatever that means, uh, the solution that's found by gradient descent is often one that generalizes well. And maybe most surprisingly is the fact that there seems to be no explicit bias variance trade-off. That means I can train huge models on small data sets and they will still generalize very well. Uh, and the way we, in which we think about this is that the optimization implicitly induces some regularization. And these are all things that um, we don't have a good understanding of. Okay, and that's what um, myself and many others, including in this crowd, are uh, interested in, in studying. The case that I'm going to try and make today is that maybe the language that we've developed for understanding classical machine learning, maybe the language of classical learning theory, is just not sufficient for understanding deep learning. And in that case, maybe a way to make progress is to characterize what goes on in learning, meaning study the dynamics of optimization. Think about the trajectories, not just about the final solution. So that's kind of the high level philosophical argument that I'll um, try and make today. It'll be more concrete. I'll make the case uh, more concretely, specifically for deep linear neural networks, which is kind of a um, simplified class of models that does capture many of the phenomena that I mentioned before. And that's what we're going to do now. Okay, so um, the content basically that I'll present today is, is um, relies on four previous uh, papers from the last couple of years. My amazing collaborators, Sanjeev Vora and Elad Hazan from um, Princeton, and students Wei Hu, um, Noah Golowich, Yuping Luo, and my PhD student, Noam Pazi. Okay, so what are linear neural networks? Linear neural networks are, in the deep learning jargon, fully connected neural networks with linear activation or no activation. Okay? In other words, the input is mapped to the output linearly. It's a linear function, but it is parameterized as a sequence of matrix multiplications. Okay, so a priori, one could think that this is just linear predictors. But the fact that you parameterize them this way as a product of matrices, not just as a single matrix, uh, it makes a very big difference. Because when you run gradient descent over this parametrization, then gradient descent doesn't know that there's an underlying linear model. And you get a non-convex problem that has a lot of global minima and the generalization properties are also non-trivial. We're gonna see that today. And for this reason, this model is regarded as a theoretical surrogate for um, many of the phenomena in deep learning. And it's really extensively studied. This is just a sample of works from the last uh, few years. And there are many others. OK, so what we're going to do now is analyze the dynamics of gradient descent over linear neural networks, uh, come up with certain characterizations, and then we're going to use them to derive results on optimization and generalization. So let's start with the dynamical analysis. A uh, technical tool that's going to be very useful for us is gradient flow. Okay, gradient flow, that's a continuous version of gradient descent. That's what you get when you take the step size to be infinitesimally small. Okay, so if gradient descent are these discrete steps, I hope you can see my cursor, uh, then gradient flow is this continuous curve. It's a continuous curve in space, and the direction of movement at every point in time is opposite to the gradient of the objective. The reason this thing is useful is because it allows one to employ continuous mathematical machinery, um, which in certain cases is very powerful. And we're going to see how, at least in some cases, the results that we derive can be later translated to gradient descent. So gradient flow is some kind of a stepping stone that we use. All right, so this is a linear neural network. The kind of objectives that we are interested in have the following form. 
suppose that I have a loss L. Okay, this is a loss over linear models. So typically this thing is convex, could be logistic loss or L2. Uh, and this kind of loss induces an over-parameterized objective for the linear neural network. That means an objective over the N weight matrices. The value of the objective at the point W1, W2 to Wn is simply obtained by taking their product, that's the end-to-end -end effective model, and plugging that into the original loss. Okay, so these are the kind of objectives that we will study. And we are interested in gradient flow, for now, gradient flow over these kind of objectives. All right, so here's the first result. When I run gradient flow over these types of objectives, okay, then certain quantities are preserved. And it's the ones that are written here. Wj plus one transpose, that's the weight at layer Wj plus one, transpose times Wj plus one. The difference between this and Wj, Wj transpose, this thing is constant through time. Okay, for every j, for every index j, these things are invariant. They are constant through time. They do not change. So already you can see that gradient flow doesn't move arbitrarily in space. It follows certain dynamics, certain trajectories that have certain properties, in particular trajectories that maintain these um, quantities. Keeps the trajectories keep them constant. Okay, so accordingly, a definition that we're going to make is we will call the weights balanced if these quantities are equal to zero. Okay, if for every j, I take the weight matrix at layer j plus one transpose, multiply by itself, the difference between that and the weight matrix at layer j times its transpose is equal to zero for every j. That, I call that balanced. Okay? An immediate corollary of the claim is that if the weights are balanced at initialization, so all these differences are zero at initialization, then the differences are gonna stay zero throughout the entire optimization. So the weights stay balanced throughout the entire timeline. Okay. So if weights initialize balanced in a balanced way, they stay that way. And balancedness at initialization, this is something that either holds approximately or exactly under um, standard initialization schemes. So if you initialize close to zero, this thing holds approximately, and then the weights are approximately balanced and they stay approximately balanced throughout the entire path. If you initialize to this kind of residual, um, by this residual scheme, that means identity initialization, then the weights are exactly balanced and they stay that way. And moving forward, we are going to assume that the weights are balanced for gradient flow, and then in the translations that we'll seek to gradient descent, we'll relax this assumption to approximate balanceness. Okay. So now we have a property of gradient flow trajectories, and that is that they maintain balancedness. You initialize in a balanced way, and, it's, and the balancedness sustains throughout the entire optimization path. And this allows us to answer a key question, and that's the following. When we run gradient flow, over a linear neural network, okay, then at every point in time, there is an effective linear model, the product of these weight matrices, and that thing moves in space also. It follows some dynamics. We run gradient flow over the linear neural network, over the objective V, and there is some induced movement of the equivalent linear model, the end-to-end -end matrix, that's how we call this thing. And the question is, what are these dynamics that govern the end-to-end -end matrix? How does this thing move in space? And the answer is as follows. If the weights are initialized to be balanced, then the end-to-end -end matrix follows what we call the end-to-end -end dynamics. Okay? And that's what's written here. So if you ignore the blue term, then what you see is this is the end-to-end -end matrix. VEC means to just arrange the matrix as a vector. And the movement is equal to minus vectorization of the gradient at the end-to-end -end matrix. That is if I ignore the blue term. So that would just be gradient flow over the original loss. Nothing else to it. And that means that the fact that we over-parameterize with the linear neural network, everything boils down to this blue term over here. 
Okay? That's what captures the overparametrization. And this blue term is actually a preconditioner. It's a PSD matrix. And so that's, that means that what you see here is preconditioned gradient flow. Okay? Now, preconditioning is a very, very common um, class of techniques in optimization. A lot of algorithms that you know are special cases of preconditioning. For example, Newton's method, that's a preconditioner that's based on the Hessian second derivatives. And there are many other types of preconditioners. This one has a specific closed form expression. I'll write it down here. I mean, you can see it here. Please don't try to parse this. I'm just writing it down so that you see that it's not insanely complicated. Uh, let me move back a slide so that you don't spend time on it. Um, so I'm not going to get into the specific um, expression for this preconditioner. I'll just say that intuitively what it does is it reinforces movement in directions that were already taken. And that means that if I start off close to zero, the end-to-end -end matrix is close to zero, and then it moves somehow. And the singular directions that have large singular value in the matrix, the end-to-end -end matrix, these are directions in which I moved a lot. The gradient is going to be stretched more significantly in these directions. And on the other hand, directions in which I haven't moved much, the gradient is going to actually be attenuated. So in some sense, there's some kind of a momentum effect here. And this can actually be tied to momentum formally, but I won't get into that. The bottom line is that if instead of running gradient flow over a linear model, I would over-parameterize and add linear layers, uh, I am implicitly inducing a preconditioner that promotes movement in directions that have already been taken. And this is going to be key to pretty much all of the results that we're going to see today. Okay. Uh, and before getting to them, I'll just mention some kind of um, an interesting note, and that is the following. This is the end-to-end -end dynamics. In blue, that's our implicit preconditioner. It turns out that if the original loss doesn't have, and like the original loss is typically convex, so if the gradient is zero is not zero, meaning the minimum zero is not a global minimum, under that mild condition, there exists no function whose gradient gives you this expression on the right. That means that I cannot write the end-to-end -end dynamics as gradient flow over something. And so the dynamics that I get when I run gradient flow over a linear neural network, you can't obtain the same dynamics by somehow regularizing your objective or modifying it and staying with a regular linear model. What you get is something else. And this already hints to the fact that there's something different going on. Okay, so just a word about how one can prove this thing, that some expression is not a gradient. Uh, we use the gradient theorem, which means that the line integral over every closed, fur, um, every closed curve of a gradient must be zero. Therefore, if you find some curve over which the line integral, a closed curve over which the line integral is not zero, then that means that your vector field is not a gradient. Okay, so that was just kind of a, a note. Um, we're not going to use this result. We will use the end-to-end -end dynamics that we derived in the previous slide. I see that there's a question in the chat, so let's open that up and see. Sorry, I actually sent the question. Okay. <laughs> Mistake. I just wanted to tell you that my students, uh, uh, Yao Wan and uh, Qin Tian, also discovered this uh, conservation law. And then the, and, uh, another group of students used it to prove the uh, global, di uh, global convergence of uh, gradient descent for linear neural networks. I'm not good at a typing, yeah. so I'm not to write this. Yeah, but okay, so, so we're going to, yeah. Okay, so we're going to use it too. Okay, okay sorry. Thanks a lot. We're going to use it too. By now, okay. this is well known. You have to remember, this result, we derived it over two years ago. So to my knowledge, it was at the time, um, I haven't seen it beforehand. Since then, many have used it. I think many have also discovered it without using our work. Um, yeah. Well, I probably the simultaneous because Yao yeah, uh, Wen's thesis was defended two years ago. So I assume it's the simultaneous. Okay. Anyway, the main contribution that the main result that we're going to rely on is the end-to-end -end dynamics. 
Uh, I am not aware of it being derived uh, anywhere. The conservation laws, these are things that are, uh, see, these are things that many have, uh, have raised over the years. I haven't seen it before our works, maybe it was, uh, it did appear. What you should regard as a contribution is the characterization of the end-to-end -end dynamics. Okay. All right. So now let's use these dynamics and derive results on optimization and uh, generalization. So starting with optimization. All right. So before we talk about applying our dynamical analysis, let's say a word about the approach, which is at least until recently was the most prominent, and you could say maybe the classic one, inspired by the classical um, optimization theory. And that is to look at critical points. Look at the geometry of the objective. Okay, so a critical point is a point where the gradient is zero. Um, you could have different types of critical points. You could have a global minimum that is, um, or a local minimum that is good, meaning it's close in its objective value to the global minimum. You could have a local minimum that's bad. So the objective value is much higher than the global minimum. You could have a saddle that's not a global minimum. So there are directions of descent. It could be strict, meaning that there's an, at least one negative eigenvalue. So there's some direction of significant descent. Or it could be non-strict, meaning that it's very flat. Or formally, uh, there are no negative eigenvalues, only ones that are equal to zero. And a result that um, was shown, I guess, in different flavors, by different groups several years ago essentially means that if there are no bad local minima and all saddle points are strict so you don't have any points like this and you don't have any points like this then roughly speaking gradient descent will converge to a global minimum okay um, and this is very encouraging because you can hope to show prove convergence to global minimum without carefully worrying about the interaction between the landscape and the algorithm, just analyzing the landscape on its own. Once you have this result, you can apply it if the two conditions hold. And indeed, there were a lot of works that um, studied these properties for different kinds of objectives. Okay, no bad local minima and no non-strict saddles or strict saddle properties sometimes called. And um, there were some success uh, stories proofs of convergence to global minimum. Uh, to what I know, at least the use of this basic result, um, the success stories were limited to shallow models, two layers. And there's an obvious reason for this, and that is that when you go beyond two layers to deep models, then you will no longer meet the strict saddle property. Uh, and to see this, just think about even a simple model like a linear neural network with three layers or more, when all the weights are zero, then all the second derivatives are going to be zero. And if that point is not a minimum, then it will be a non-strict saddle. And usually it's not a local minimum or a global minimum, the zero point. So at least this basic landscape approach, which um, has underlied many works, it's very, very difficult to apply it to any model beyond two layers. Um, and what we're going to do is apply our dynamical analysis. Let's just see if there's a question here. Yeah, so there's a question by Lenka. Would a momentum added to the gradient add a similar effect as a preconditioner? If not, what would be the... So you could actually see what goes on here. That preconditioner is some kind of a specific momentum uh, scheme. Okay, it's some specific momentum scheme, an adaptive learning rate. Uh, it's not equivalent to the momentum, exactly the momentum that we usually use. Okay. Uh, just to um, be clear, is that equivalent, it's not equivalent to any of the uh, common uh, algorithms like Adam or Adagrad? It's not. Okay. No, it's something else. Mm. No, Great. it's something else. Uh, okay. So now let's apply our dynamical analysis. So here it is. Okay, this is the end-to-end -end dynamics. This is the implicit preconditioner. Uh, something which is easy to show, I'm not showing it, but I guess uh, bear with me on this, is that uh, if, or, or put it differently, 
This preconditioner will be positive definite, so it'll be non-singular if the end-to-end -end matrix is non-singular, if it has full rank. Okay? So if the end-to-end -end matrix is full rank, then the preconditioner is positive definite, so it will not kill a non-zero gradient. That means that the loss is going to continue to decrease until one of two things happen. Either the gradient of the original loss is zero, so there's no movement whatsoever, or maybe you hit singularity, which means that maybe the preconditioner is positive semi-definite, so maybe it is able to kill some non-zero gradient. So one of these two things have to happen. Otherwise, you're going to continue to go down. The loss is going to continue to decrease. And typically, the setting that we look at is where the L, the loss over the original linear model, not over the linear network, not the overparameterized objective, the origin, but the original loss, that thing is usually convex. And so condition number one, gradient equal to zero, that means that the global minimum was reached. Right? And so we get the following corollary. Suppose we have a convex loss and the linear neural net is initialized such that, first of all, the second condition here, the weights are balanced. And in addition to that, if the loss at initialization is better than the loss for any singular matrix, so by going down, you're not going to hit singularity, then only condition number one uh, can happen. And that means that you'll eventually converge to global minimum. Okay, so I'll talk about how reasonable these assumptions are in the next slide. But for now, um, all you have to know is that we have a convergence result to global minimum for gradient flow uh, under two conditions on initialization. Okay? So there's obviously no notion of computational efficiency here because it's gradient flow. Uh, and to deal with that, we translate this result to gradient descent. So I won't show the analysis, I'll just show the final result that we obtain. So this is the corollary that we had for gradient flow. And what I'm going to do now is rewrite this corollary. I'll start by rewriting it in an equivalent way. I'll just write it a little bit differently. So first of all, instead of saying that the loss is better than the loss of any singular matrix, I'll just say that it's better than the loss of any matrix that has some z singular value that's equal to zero. It's the same thing. Uh, now, instead of saying that all the weights are balanced, I'll just write down the definition. This is the definition of balancedness. And now, instead of saying that the left-hand side is equal to the right-hand side, I'll just say that the norm of their difference is zero. Okay? So I haven't done anything up to this point. I just rewrote the corollary. And now we're going to convert it to a theorem for gradient descent. So we proved this for L2 loss specifically. Uh, the proof can be extended to any strongly convex and uh, smooth loss. And what we do is modify the assumptions uh, to a uh, discrete setting. So now, instead of requiring that the loss be better than the loss of any matrix that is singular, we require a little bit more. We want to be better than the loss of any matrix that's almost singular, meaning that it has some singular value that's smaller than C. C is going to be a free parameter that you can play with. So that's one thing we require. It's a little bit more than the uh, original requirement. The second, balance this require requirement, we relax it a little bit. Instead of requiring that the norms will be exactly zero, we want it to be smaller than something that scales like C squared. And now, under these two assumptions, gradient descent with a step size that scales like C to the fourth gives you exponentially fast convergence to global minimum. Okay, it's linear rate convergence, e to the minus constant times t, the iteration number. So what you see here is a guarantee of efficient convergence to global minimum for an arbitrarily deep model and any width um, under two assumptions on initialization. Okay, so what can we say about these assumptions? First of all, we know that they are both necessary in the sense that violating any one, I, I mean, if I erase one of them from the theorem, it, it's no longer true. It's easy to come up with counterexamples um, for which uh, convergence does not take place or even divergence takes place. So maybe I can weaken the assumptions. I can't just throw one of them away. The second thing we can show is that in the case where the output dimension is one, 
so you're doing kind of scalar regression, uh, both of these conditions hold with constant probability. And by constant, I don't mean some positive constant, I mean significant, something close to 0.5. They hold with constant probability under a random initialization that's very similar to what people usually use, but not exactly. We call it random balanced initialization. And this means that for output dimension one, use this random initialization with probability close to 0.5, you will get linear rate convergence to global minimum. Again, this holds for arbitrarily deep models and also uh, any kind of width that you would like. And to my knowledge, this is uh, the most general result of its kind, which means minimizing kind of converging to global minimum that doesn't reside in infinity, but concrete global minimum. And uh, deep models are arbitrarily deep and also with a width that's practical, something that you could actually run on your computer. Um, and this was possible thanks to the dynamical characterization. And what we'll see now is something that I think is more interesting and attests more to the um, potential of um, the dynamical approach, and that is the effect of depth on optimization. So the conventional wisdom in classical learning theory is that convex optimization is easier than non-convex, right? Nothing is better than to just have one minimum. And that means that optimizing a deep network is harder than optimizing just a linear model because the latter will give you a convex problem and the former will not. Um, and what we're gonna see through the dynamical analysis is that this is not always the case. Okay. Um, so here's a, the end-to-end -end dynamics, this time in the discrete variant. So instead of derivatives, we see these discrete steps, but you still have everything's the same. This is our preconditioner. And what we can show for, these, uh, for this discrete scheme is that for any p greater than 2, okay, for any p greater than 2, there exist settings with the LP loss. LP loss means the p norm of the difference between true label and prediction to the power of p. It's a convex loss. And there exist settings with this loss where the discrete end-to-end -end dynamics reach global minimum arbitrarily faster than gradient descent. That means that however faster you want it to be, I will carefully construct some data set that will give you that kind of acceleration. So this shows theoretically that there exist settings where gradient, uh, where instead of optimizing a linear model giving you a convex problem, if you artificially non-convexify the problem and run gradient descent on that, you will actually converge much, much faster, even though you didn't gain anything in terms of expressiveness. Okay, so this is um, was very surprising. Uh, it goes against the conventional wisdom that we have. Uh, it is, however, a theoretical result. It shows that there exist certain data sets that will give rise to this phenomenon. It doesn't tell you anything about how common it is, and for that, we run experiments. So we ran a multitude of experiments on various settings. I'll just show here the most basic one. That's a regression problem um, from UCI machine learning repository. We use L4 loss here, uh, P greater than two. And this is what you get when you compare gradient descent with a one layer model. That's the blue line, it's a convex problem. And versus when you over parameterize and optimize a non-convex problem. So this is two layers and three layers. And you see that the convergence is much faster. Um, this is log scale here for the loss. Okay? And just in terms of the protocol, what you see here is the fastest convergence for each model that was obtained over a grid search on learning rates. Okay? That's what you see here. And also, for this specific problem where the output dimension is one, every hidden layer, I mean, it works for any width, but in this, just to make the point, in this plot, every hidden layer is just a scalar. So even if you compare convergence versus not iteration, but versus flops or computations, it's still way faster um, over parameterizing. And we also try to compare the implicit acceleration of over parameterization to explicit acceleration methods like Atagrad and things like that. And it oftentimes in these problems gives you much faster convergence. We also tried it for nonlinear models without theory. And after this work, many have also um, employed this technique, using it in kind of realistic practical settings. For example, in the last uh, NeurIPS, it was an oral that used over-parameterization in order to accelerate optimization. 
The bottom line here is that depth can speed up gradient descent even without any gain in expressiveness and despite the fact that it introduces non-convexity. So this doesn't happen all the time, not for any kind of objective, but it happens a lot for every loss that's based on that LP with P greater than two, everyone I've tried, synthetic data, realistic data, it always happened. Um, and this shows you that sometimes non-convexity is actually a good thing. And it's very hard to reach this conclusion if you adopt the classical perspective, looking at critical points and things like that. You really have to look at the dynamics in order to reach this kind of conclusion. Okay. Uh, and now let's move to generalization. So the setting that we're going to look at for generalization is one where um, it's very clear what generalization mean, means. It's going to be kind of a test bed where um, it's very clear what it means to generalize, and that will be matrix completion, where the objective is to recover a low-rate matrix given a subset of entries. Okay. So for example, think of the Netflix, famous Netflix prize. There's some big matrix, rows correspond to users, columns correspond to movies. Uh, you get small number of filled in ratings and you would like to complete this matrix in order to recommend uh, movies to users. This is a matrix completion problem. And the assumption, it's obviously an underdetermined problem. The assumption, the standard one, is that the grand truth matrix has low rank. Okay? So what you want to solve is the following. If I denote the observations by VIJ, where ij ranges over some set of observed indices, then what I would like to solve is the following problem. I want to minimize the rank subject to agreeing with the observations. And that's what I want to solve. This is, in the worst case, a computationally hard problem. Um, there's a convex programming approach to it, which is to relax the rank and replace it by the nuclear norm. Okay, nuclear norm, that's the sum of singular values. It's kind of a convex relaxation of rank. And now what I solve is I minimize the nuclear norm subject to agreeing with the constraints, with the observed entries. And this is a convex problem, so I can solve it efficiently. And it turns out, I guess it's somewhat surprising if you don't know this kind of material, that this gives you a perfect reconstruction if you have enough observations. And that's a big if there. So the number of observations you need is the number of degrees of freedom, which is the minimum, times some logarithmic factors. So in this would, some would regard this as optimal, but actually these logarithmic factors make a really big difference and we're gonna see that. Okay. A different approach that one can take, kind of a deep learning approach, um, call it deep matrix factorization, is to just parameterize the solution, parameterize the matrix that you're reconstructing as a product of matrices, parameterize it as a linear neural network. You could limit the shared dimensions and therefore thereby control the rank, uh, but, you, but the more interesting case that we are um, studying is where you don't limit these shared dimensions, so you don't explicitly constrain the rank, you over-parameterize, and you then minimize the L2 loss. Okay, so this is the objective that you optimize. It's sum over the observed entries of the difference between uh, your models but the entry in your model and the observed entry, the difference squared. Okay, so this is a non-convex loss. There's no explicit regularization here. And this setting has been looked into, specifically by Gunasekar et al. They looked at the case of depth two. And what they found empirically is that even though there's no explicit regularization here, when you run gradient descent on the objective that you see here, oftentimes you get a good recovery. You recover low rank matrices. What they conjectured is that gradient descent converges to the minimal nuclear norm solution. That means that, the conjecture means that under the hood, what's happening here in this setting is actually the convex programming approach that we saw in the previous slide. And they were actually able to prove this um, in a certain case, in some restricted uh, case. And others have also proven this for very special cases. Okay, so this is um, what we look into. And the first thing we did was run further experiments with additional depths, not just depth two. And so we compare gradient descent over a linear neural network. We compare that to the minimal nuclear norm solution. So 
in these plots, what you see, this is a set of experiments, a set of matrix completion experiments. X axis, that shows you the number of entries. Okay, so every tick here, that's a different experiment. Y axis on the left side, get, that's the reconstruction error. And on the right side, that's the nuclear norm. And we compare the minimum nuclear norm solution to a two layer linear neural network and a three layer linear neural network. Uh, this is a 100 by 100 matrix, rank five. And what you see here is that when you have a lot of observations, then the minimal nuclear norm gives you pretty much the grand truth. The reconstruction error of the red um, line here is very, very low. And so you can see that the nuclear norm of the grand truth in purple here coincides with the nuclear norm that, that, that is minimal. And the linear neural nets, blue and orange line here, they also can give you zero reconstruction error. So they also reach the grand truth and everything coincides. And so they do give you the minimal nuclear norm solution. On the other hand, when you have a small number of observations, then this is no longer the case. The minimal nuclear norm solution is very far from the grand truth. And that means that the minimal nuclear norm is much smaller than the nuclear norm of the grand truth. And you can see that the linear neural nets, when they have to make a choice between minimizing nuclear norm and minimizing rank, uh, they choose the latter. And this is actually more prominent with higher depth. In this case, what you see here is depth three, but when you go beyond that, it's even more significant. So the bottom line, what you see in this experiment is that at least here in this setting, it seems that the linear neural net is willing to give up on minimum nuclear norm in favor of finding the minimal rank. And this is more prominent as you add depth. So this is um, kind of what we saw empirically. And then what we did is to apply the dynamical analysis and try and um, support this theoretically. Okay, so this is our end-to-end -end dynamics. In green, that's the end-to-end -end matrix. Here's our preconditioner. And two results that we uh, prove is the first one relates to the dynamics of singular values. So we denote the singular values of the end-to-end -end matrix by sigma r and u r v r. These are corresponding left and right singular vectors. And the first thing we show is the following. We are going to interpret this, so don't worry about the exact expression. The um, take home here from this slide is that we have a description, a closed form description of the dynamics of the singular values. Okay. We have a closed form description of the dynamics of singular values. And using this, we can show that for depths greater than two, two or more, the determinant um, does not change sign. And that's a direct outcome of this theorem that you see here. And now we're going to apply both of these results. Okay? So first of all, we apply the corollary, that the determinant does not change sign. And we apply it to show that there exist settings where not only is nuclear norm not minimized, but no norm is being minimized. And here's the setting. Here's an example, the simplest one that we could come up with. You're trying to complete a two by two matrix and the off diagonal observation, you see them and uh, they are observed, they're equal to one. And the bottom right entry, you see it two, it's equal to zero. Top left, you don't see it. Okay, so this is a valid, simple matrix completion problem. And let's look at the solution set here. Okay, and see which solutions minimize what. So it's not difficult to show that any Shatton P norm or even Shatton P quasi norm, and that includes in special cases, many of the norms that you know, like nuclear, Frobenius, spectral norm, any one of these, if you want to minimize them over the solution set, you have to take the unobserved entry to be equal to zero. Okay. If you want to minimize any norm or quasi norm, anything, obviously, um, the unobserved entry needs to be finite, needs to be bounded. You give me a norm, a quasi-norm, and that'll induce some bound necessary on the unobserved entry. On the other hand, in terms of rank, what you see here is that all the solutions will have rank two, but you can approach rank one if you take the unobserved entry to be plus infinity or minus infinity. So to minimize rank, you need to take the absolute value of the unobserved entry to infinity. And the key property, what's special about this setting is that there's a contradiction between minimizing norms and minimizing rank. And if you want to minimize norms, you have to confine the unobserved entry to a finite range, uh, even zero if it's Shatton norms. 
On the other hand, if you want to minimize rank, you have to take the unobserved entry to infinity. An outcome of the corollary is the following. Because the determinant doesn't change sign, then if it starts out positive and I fit the observations, then think of what happens here. I have, what's the determinant equal to? It's equal to the unobserved value times something that's close to zero minus something close to one times something close to one. So this thing will be negative unless the unobserved entry is huge and it needs to grow the more you fit the observed values. So if the determinant is positive, fitting observations means that the unobserved entry goes to infinity. And this also um, happens empirically. Here's a kind of a sample of an experiment. This is the value, the absolute value of the unobserved entry against the loss during a run, a typical run. You can see that it indeed grows. The bottom line is that there exist settings where the implicit regularization of linear neural networks uh, drives all norms to infinity while it minimizes rank. So you can't think of this implicit regularization as minimization of some norm. It's different from the classic regularizers that we are used to. Okay. And what we then did is use the result on the dynamics of singular values uh, to come up with a different explanation of what goes on here. It's a very different perspective. Okay. So now let's interpret this result. So we have the dynamics of the singular values, how they move in time. And this is the expression. There's some term here in orange times multiplied by the projection of the gradient onto the singular component that corresponds to the singular values. So sigma r, that's the rth singular value. ur and vr, these are the corresponding singular vectors. So notice that given a value for the end-to-end -end matrix, the depth n affects these dynamics only through these orange terms, only through these factors. If you don't have these factors, then depth doesn't come to play at all, given a value for the end-to-end -end matrix. So it all boils down to these factors. And it's easy to see that in the case of n equals 1, that's just a classic linear model, these factors just reduce to 1. So they don't exist. And as you add depth, what they do is they speed up large singular values and they slow down small ones. So let's see this. So I have a multiplication by n here. That's just a constant. doesn't matter. Um, but these factors, these sigma r's, matter a lot. right? If sigma r is large, then this factor is going to be large, and it's going to enhance the movement. On the other hand, if sigma r is small, the factors are going to be small, and they are going to attenuate the movement. So large singular values move much more than small ones. And this power, 2 minus 2 over n, it's bigger for larger n. For deeper models. So the deeper your model is, the more significant this effect is going to be. Now we could imagine that this thing would lead to, um, would have a tendency to low rank solutions for the following reasons. Suppose that I initialize close to zero, as normally um, we do. All the singular values are going to be small and they are barely going to move. And then they're slowly, slowly, slowly going to move because you need to fit the loss, the, the training data. And then once a singular value crosses some critical threshold, then it's going to move rapidly, kind of jump up. And then the remaining singular values that are still small are going to still move very, very slowly. And then once another one hits a threshold, it's going to move fast. And so you can intuitively expect to get this kind of behavior that singular values start off small and then shoot up one by one. And this is exactly what we see in experiments. And this is the completion of a low rank matrix using gradient descent over a linear neural network. Uh, so on the left, that's depth one. That's just the linear model, standard. So there's no, accel like the, this effect of enhancing or attenuating movement of singular values does not appear. All the singular values rise in tandem and you indeed get a very bad reconstruction error, 0.8. Uh, once you move to depth two, the reconstruction error is much better. And you can start seeing this effect. If singular values are small and then they, Kind of incrementally start going up one by one, you end up with five large singular values and a lot of singular values that are smaller. And the grand truth is indeed rank five. So the reconstruction error is 0.06. And when you add another layer, the effect becomes more prominent. Now the reconstruction error is orders of magnitude lesser. And now basically you end up with five large singular values and all the rest are 
pretty much at zero. So you can actually see this effect here. Uh, in terms of full-blown theoretical result all the way, we show that for a very simple case, which is just a single observation. And what we know is that in this case, you could actually analyze and come up with closed form expressions for the uh, relationships between singular values. And we know that if the depth is one, then the relationships are linear. So like one singular value will always be five times less than another one. If you add another layer, then the relationships become polynomial. So one singular value can be the square root of the other. And then if you go to higher depths, then the relationships start being asymptotic. So one singular value could grow to infinity and the other wouldn't even pass some finite threshold. Okay, so this is kind of for the um, single observation case. Bottom line is that through the dynamical analysis, we see that depth leads to larger gaps between singular values, um, which is exactly lower rank. So it's a different kind of explanation. It's a different perspective. Uh, but it does support the, the empirical uh, phenomenon. And the dynamical analysis shows you that norms can't really provide the answer, any type of norm. Okay, so this is kind of a third example uh, where we use the dynamical analysis to overcome problems with um, classical appro or approaches that are based on the classical viewpoint of learning theory. And so now uh, let's conclude. And then we'll have few minutes for questions. So we'll start with a recap. The perspective that I'm trying to make today is that understanding optimization, generalization, deep learning, maybe the language of classical learning theory is just insufficient and we should adopt a new language as opposed to trying to explain phenomena using concepts that we have had. Um, and what I'm arguing is that Maybe it'd be, be, it would be uh, beneficial to take a dynamical systems perspective and analyze the dynamics of gradient descent. Okay. Concretely, what we looked at is deep linear neural networks. Um, the dynamical analysis showed us that depth induces a preconditioner that promotes movement directions already taken. And we use this to analyze optimization and generalization. So for optimization, we derived a guarantee of efficient convergence to global minimum for any depth and any width. Um, this is the most general guarantee of its kind that I'm aware of. And we showed, more surprisingly, maybe that depth can actually accelerate convergence, even when it doesn't give you anything in terms of expressiveness. And for generalization, we showed that depth induces an implicit regularization towards low rank. It leads to gaps between singular values. Uh, and this regularization is different from any type of norm minimization. And that gives you generalization for matrix completion. So these are kind of three examples where a classically inspired approach um, kind of hits a barrier, becomes difficult unless you start circumventing and doing new things. And uh, on the other hand, if you take a dynamical approach, then uh, you can reach um, farther. Okay. And I really think that this uh, is something that could be key to a better understanding of, of deep learning in general. Obviously, linear neural networks are nice because we can analyze them. Uh, but they are not really what happens in deep learning. Deep learning is nonlinear. And um, what I will just mention right now is that some of this analysis can actually go beyond linear neural networks. Okay, so linear neural networks, they are equivalent to matrix factorizations. And so I can think of a network as a product of matrices. And in this graphical um, factorization language, it would look like this chain. Every node is a matrix. And the chain together gives me kind of a meta node with two edges, and that's also a matrix. And you can, other than this chain, you can factorize in many other ways. You can factorize tensors, multi-dimensional arrays. And you can do so in various ways. You can factorize tensors hierarchically, hierarchically. And there are many ways to do this, for example, with a tree architecture or with a train architecture. And it turns out that just like matrix factorization corresponds to linear neural networks, then these tensor factorizations correspond to nonlinear neural networks of a certain kind. Okay, and these nonlinear neural networks, uh, a tree structure that corresponds to a convolutional architecture, and a train structure corresponds to a recurrent architecture. Um, and so you can lift this equivalence beyond linear neural networks 
the kind of networks that you get are arithmetic. And that means that the nonlinearities are, they come from products. So basically these are polynomial neural networks. Okay, so it's a certain kind of nonlinearity, uh, not the one that's most common, definitely not in um, many application domains where value is used and things like that. Uh, but it does work well in practice. Okay, these things are implemented in TensorFlow and CAFE, their implementations online, and they do work well. They reach over 90% on CIFAR. And so to me, I feel like they do capture the essence of deep learning. And on the other hand, they do give you an algebraic structure that you might be able to analyze. And actually, um, many of the results that I talked about today do transfer to these kind of models. For example, the conservation laws. So they are different, they take a different form, but um, pretty much the things that you saw for the linear neural networks have a tensor variant in the arithmetic neural networks. And I hope that this direction uh, would take us one step further towards understanding um, optimization, generalization, and deep learning, and maybe making our understanding there a little bit deeper. So at this point, I'll conclude. Let's see what the questions. Whoa. Um, thank you very much, okay. Nadav. Um, so yeah, we do have one question from Linka. Uh, do you want to unmute yourself or I can read your question? Uh, maybe I'll just read. So uh, let me ask whether basically, what, so you talk about optimization, but whether uh, your understanding can be generalized to the generalization properties of nonlinear uh, neural networks. Uh, maybe so nonlinear activation function, um, something like that. So the, that, that's so I see in the chat something else, but I'll go with what you're asking. So you're saying extending to nonlinear neural networks? That's the uh, yeah, and learn something that is not, you know, uh, linear yeah. form. Yeah. So yeah, basically. Yeah. Question. Okay. Yeah. So so I tried to answer this in the last slide. The way the path that I feel is most promising is to look at these polynomial neural networks. I know that they're not exactly what most people use. Uh, I kind of feel that. They do capture the essence of deep learning. Maybe if Google and um, Facebook would decide that they're important, then they could re bring them to state-of-the-art level. Um, but that these are nonlinear models. They do work competitively, not state-of-the-art, but they do work well. And there, I believe that there's a much greater chance to really understand them, and maybe from there on continue to more uh, contemporary models. To me, the fact that, like ReLU, the fact that it's uh, very, very fast in implementation from a theoretical standpoint, it doesn't mean that it's um, the only thing that one should look at. But but that's a valid point. Uh, I, I Some of the things actually could be extended to ReLU. And I did have works on, on extension of expressiveness results from arithmetic neural nets to ReLU nets. But for now, the analysis of optimization generalization, um, I feel that a much more feasible um, step would be to look at arithmetic models. But I'd be happy if someone else took the challenge and looked um, at value and things like that. Thank you. Uh, so I have another question. So uh, in this series, we have many talks about like your tendon kernel and the mean field approach for understanding uh, very wide neural networks. So how do you compare yeah. your results with these results? It seems that your result does not really require the width to be very large. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. So first of all, I'm very kind of um, fond of these, of the NTK um, line of works. I taught it my course uh, last semester. Uh, to me, I don't see a direct technical connection. I do see some kind of high level trade off that the advantage of the analysis that I am showing is that it's finite, it's concrete. These are models that actually run on your computer. Everything is feasible. The disadvantage is that it's linear as opposed to MTK. So it feels like every, like these two um, directions, each has its own ups and downs. In terms of a technical, um, deep technical connection, it's not something that I, um, it's not something that I've been um, employing or I haven't really thought too deeply about this. Maybe there are. Okay. 
Um, are there any more questions from the audience? Uh, if you have questions, you can just unmute yourself. Uh, maybe let me ask one more question. Uh, so in your experience about okay. matrix completion, uh, are these results about uh, noisiness, uh, matrix completion? And have yeah. you have any thoughts or have you done any experience on the noisy matrix completion? Because as we know, uh, nuclear norm minimization also works with certain variants, also works for noisy matrix completion. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's a great question. So. From a theoretical standpoint, everything I showed is, I, I didn't derive bounds on reconstruction here. Yeah. So everything I showed applies. Um, empirically, we didn't, we didn't run experiments on the noisy case. Um, and it's an interesting question that I right now don't have an answer to. Which algorithm is more um, robust? Okay, uh, I see now that Lenka wrote that there's one question number one yeah. Yeah, so maybe, maybe I'll answer that. Mm. Okay, it's okay. Uh, so she's asking, saying that matrix completion is an unsupervised problem and there's no difference between input data and labels. Um, and so how, how does matrix completion even address the, que the generalization gap? Um, the question of generalization gap. What, what's the relation? That, at least that's how I understand the question. Lenka, if you want to approve. Um, okay, so the perspective that one can take on matrix completion is actually as a supervised problem. You can think of a location in the matrix as the data point, as the instance, and the value in that location as the label. Okay? And then when you get a bunch of observations, the, that, that's your training data. You see locations in the matrix and labels. And what you are trying to do is uh, infer the labels of the locations that you haven't seen. That means to reconstruct the matrix. So formally, you can frame it exactly as a generalization problem when you're, um, and if you wanna measure the L2 loss, for example, that would correspond to a uniform distribution over entries. Like the ex expectation, right, of the difference between your prediction and the real label when entries are distributed uniformly in the matrix, that's exactly, that, that's exactly L2 loss. So I hope that answered the question. Happy to take this offline. If anybody else has any questions, um, always happy to talk about these things. Any more questions? Um, can I ask a question? Yes. So for, um, for matrix completion, for example, if you if you run the experiments and your I, I, I see that you can use matrix factorization if your matrices are fairly small in the middle to enforce low rank. But um, how wide do you choose them? And if you if you have a few extra layers that are fairly small, but and you underestimate the rank of your matrix, what happens? Great question. So everything, um, everything applies in terms of the analytical results. The, the regime that we looked into in all the experiments are in the case where you don't limit the rank, where the regularization is implicit. You don't explicitly limit the rank. If you explicitly limit the rank, that's actually what people initially did with matrix factorization and a lot of them still do it then you are basically explicitly regularizing and you can force the rank. And if you underestimate, then, then tough luck. Um, you're not gonna get a higher rank solution than what you forced, right? So the regime of interest, what we looked into is a case where the width does not limit the rank. In the experiments that you saw, the width was always set to um, the minimal value, which doesn't limit rank. The results, the characterizations, they still hold even if the, if, even if the um, hidden layers are wider. So I hope you. that answers the question. Yes, thank you.
Um, any more questions? Okay, then let's thank uh, Nadav again and uh, see you, thank you in the very next much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Right, thank you.